Hello, once again to everyone, as we uh, are going to get into our next Exodus Bible study. Um, I was just thinking, one of the things that, that has happened during the coronavirus is we complain about all the different uh, things that uh, we've had to do and, and how um, so many changes have had to be made. But here's a blessing, maybe, that um, you could be watching this in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. Um, you don't have to dress up and, and come to church on Sunday morning to have Bible study or, or Tuesday evening that we do a lot of time. So you could be watching this in your PJs, and that's great. So hey, there's a, there's a blessing. So yes, today we're going to get into, this is our sixth installment of the book of Exodus. If you want to start from the beginning, you can certainly do so um, and look at our other videos. But if you don't want to, jump right in. I think you'll get something out of it today. And we'll do a little bit of review and background as well. So let's begin with prayer, and then we'll get into today's Bible study, we pray. Dear Lord God, thank you for today, the opportunity to be in your word. You tell us that your word is powerful and that your word is true. So we ask that you work that powerful truth in our hearts and in our lives, even as you promise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, today we are going to, as I said, go to Exodus. Let me um, share that with you. We just need to pull up our Bible study for today. And that should be happening here in just a moment. There we go. Um, we also want to begin our slideshow here. From the beginning. There we go. Okay, so Exodus, God keeps his promises. There we've got our artwork and the burning bush. We had that in lesson three. Uh, this thing will, will uh, be a prominent part of our lesson today, the staff of Aaron slash staff of Moses, as we got some of these neat key features of, of what happened in the book of Exodus in our artwork. So let's just do a little review. We've been doing this. It's a nice word for a quiz, your quiz for the week, uh, based on what we looked at mostly last week. Aaron and Moses approached Pharaoh with their request to have a festival to the Lord in the desert. Remember, God said to do that, go to the Pharaoh and ask for that. How did Pharaoh respond? What was his response to their request? Did he give them three days off? Did he give them animals for sacrifice? Did he kick them out of Egypt or did he increase their workload? And the answer is D. Yeah, he increased their workload. I think they asked at one point for three days, um, but he didn't give it. Did he give them animals? No. Did he kick them out of Egypt? That's definitely what he didn't want to do. He wanted to hang on to them. So yeah, he increased their workload. Second review. How did Pharaoh make life even harder? For the Israelites, we read about last week, um, they had to collect their own straw for making bricks, A. Was it B, they had to find their own food to eat? Is it C, that they could no longer use oxen to pull their wagons? Or is it D, that they no longer were paid for their work? And the answer there is, what's your guess? It's A. Yeah, they had to collect their own straw for making bricks, which seemed very laborious for them, but apparently before it was provided and no longer um, were they able to do that. They had to bring their own brick making materials, at least the straw. Um, as far as finding their own food, they probably had to do that already. Oxen don't know about that. And D, of course, they were not paid, I wouldn't imagine, as they were slaves. Third review question, the Israelites overseers reacted to Moses and Aaron by, I apologize for missing my uh, possessive there. Um, the Israelites overseers reacted to Moses and Aaron by A, thanking them for sharing God's plans with them. So remember, um, Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh. Pharaoh says no to their request and then he calls the Israelite overseers to them. Um, Pharaoh does, and he has an, an interview with them. Now, um, the overseers go back to Moses and Aaron. 
So that's what I'm asking. So after the overseers of the all the work, they go back, they talk to Pharaoh. Now they're talking to Moses and Aaron. So how do they react? Did they thank Moses and Aaron for sharing God's plan, plans with them? Did they be attempt to kill Moses and Aaron because Pharaoh made life even harder? That would be a very opposite reaction, A and B. Um, C, did they rejoice that God was starting his plan to deliver them? Or D, did they ask God to judge Moses and Aaron? This might be the hardest one today to remember all this. Um, the answer here is D. Yeah, they asked God to judge Moses and Aaron. In other words, they were not real happy because Moses, or excuse me, uh, Pharaoh increased their workload and beat them, actually. And now they go beaten up and bloodied back to Moses and Aaron and say, God judge you for what you did. Now, granted, Moses and Aaron are simply doing what God asked them to do. This was not their wild scheme. But the overseers, um, I guess if they were full of the Holy Spirit and they were trusting God's promises, maybe A and C would apply. Um, but they would say, hey, this is, this is all part of it. We understand Moses and Aaron. God told you to do this. We're, we're looking forward to that deliverance. Um, they weren't quite there, though, were they? And our last review question is, God gave wonderful assurances to the Israelites of what he would soon do for them. They were. So it was hard for them to believe all this, but God came to them. God promised them, this is what I'm going to do for you. Um, what were those assurances? Was it this, that they would be freed from slavery? Was it B, that God promised that he would be their God and they would be his people? C, that they would go into a new land, which was all their own? Or is it D, that God would perform mighty acts of judgment to free them? And the answer there is A, that they would be free from slavery. And B, that he promised he would be their God and they would be his people. And C, they would go into a new land, which was all their own and you know it's coming. Also D, that God would perform mighty acts of judgment to free them. So, um, yeah, that was a trick question, kind of. But all of those things, God promised them. I am not beyond a trick question. You know that if you've been to our Sunday School Bible studies at all. All right, new material today. We will get into it. And um, if you want to grab your Bible and follow along, at least you can reference that. I will have the... Um, text on the screen too, but it's not always going to be visible. So you may just want to have your Bible nearby as I do. So we begin today at Exodus chapter 6, verse 28. In our first section here, we're going to go through chapter 7, verse 7. Now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? How many times have we heard that already? That, that seems to be Moses' go-to um, complaint or excuse. I hate these lips. These, these don't work very well. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. And your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you. And your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to tell the Israelites, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. All right, kind of a sort of a summary of where we've been. Um, to this point in the book of, of uh, Exodus, at least as far as God raising up Moses to go down. We have skipped a little bit of Exodus chapter 6. What we skipped was a genealogy. Not that that genealogy is not important. It is. Um, God included it for us as well. I just chose to bypass it a little bit. You can certainly reference it. What you'll notice is it's basically a genealogy of tribe of Levi, um, focusing on that tribe, and that makes sense as Moses and Aaron are coming from the tribe of Levi. And then you also see 
um, some of the descendants um, of the tribe of Levi, the Kohathites and the Gershonites and those kind of people. The only reason that might be important is um, they're the, the tribes that later are going to be having functions with the tabernacle and the temple. But um, yeah, we, we are skipping that little bit for right now. So some questions on that section. What two things will God accomplish with the sending of the plagues that he says in that section? Well, he's going to deliver Israel. That seems obvious. Um, he Maybe we could say there are also three things. He also says that he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Um, but the other thing um, that he does mention there is that Egypt would also come to understand that the Lord is God. Remember, the Egyptians have all of their own goddesses and God. Basically, it seems like a, a nature worship in a lot of different ways. The sun, the moon, the river, the basics of life, um, which makes sense. Uh, most cultures um, have a God and it's, you know, gods of thunder and war and, and power and, and those type of things. So, um, of course, they're a step removed, though, from the creator of, of all of those things. So um, Egypt would come to understand not necessarily that they're going to be converted, um, that they're going to be believers, but they were going to understand that this, this happened because the Lord is God. The plagues themselves, so that's what God is talking about when he says, just to back up a section here, he said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Um, verse 4, I will lay my hand on Egypt and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my people, the Israelites. So those mighty acts of judgment, there's going to be 10 of them that we call the plagues. So just a little bit of introduction. There's some kind of neat things to just notice about the plagues as we get into plague number one today. Um, just some summary thoughts here that there are the, the first nine, the 10th is going to be the plague on the firstborn, but they kind of break down into interesting groups of three. So you've got the first three here, the blood, the frogs, the gnats, the first, or excuse me, the second three, the flies, animal disease, and boils. The, it was the plague on livestock, number five. And then the last three are hail and locusts and darkness. And what we notice about them is for each series, so each one that's a series there, one, two, three, series two, four, five, six, series three, we'll call it seven, eight, nine. The first two are always given as warnings to Pharaoh. So Moses says, this is what's coming. This is what's going to happen. The third in each series, God just sends. There is no warning for Pharaoh. It just happens unannounced. So that's, that's an interesting little pattern. Um, they also point to the number 10, uh, the number of completeness. So it's all kind of uh, preliminary for the, for the most severe, which is going to be the plague on the firstborn um, with the Passover. And then next, there is an increase in severity, severity in each group and as a whole. So what we're saying is um, this seems to be the... Um, maybe the easiest to handle, not that it was easy, that the water was turned to blood. But what we're saying is all of these are an increase in severity in each series and as a whole. So we're going to say darkness is going to be the most severe. And you might look at that and say, bugs, grasshoppers, darkness, that, that does, doesn't seem as bad as boils and, and blood and gnats. But we'll talk about that as we get to those um, as we get to those plagues and why that is the case. Um, another uh, another uh, summary here on it. Oh, that's a little out of order. Beginning with the second series, the Israelites are spared. So that's also something to note. So the first three plagues happen to, to everybody, um, Israelite and Egyptian. Starting with the second series, four through 10, only happens to the Egyptians. So the Israelites are spared. Um, the first two plagues are copied by the magicians of Pharaoh. So blood and frogs, those are going to be copied. And we'll look at blood today. And all may be miraculous intensifications of natural occurrences. I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. I just want you to understand what I'm saying there, what I'm not saying. I am not saying that these are anything less than miracles because they are. 
but they also seem to maybe be, how about that, <laughs> seem to maybe be, um, that these might be natural things that happen and God is using them in a miraculous way. He intensifies them um, to, to strike Egypt. So for example, the flooding of the Nile and a bunch of red silt um, that came down the Nile was a natural occurring thing. That happened each and every year. But what I'm saying then, God took that natural event and intensified it. It wasn't just silt, it was actually blood. Um, so just understand what I'm saying there, um, that some of these plagues like locusts um, might have been a scourge at the time, but they're intensified in a miraculous way and obviously at the Lord's command. And there, honestly, there's still locust plagues. You can read about one in North Africa right now um, that is, is uh, affecting them. So, and, and no, maybe, maybe it's just a thought. It, it's interesting that maybe God, and a lot of miracles are that, right? That God takes something natural and he intensifies them um, in a big way. All right, let's get to the next section then, verses 7, 8 to 13. I'll read that again. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. So it's interesting, God gives them um, the knowledge of how this is all going to play out. This is what's going to happen, guys. Um, be ready for it. A uh, question I think that comes up with that section, at least a question I ask, is did the magicians really perform a miracle? So did they actually, were they actually did, able to do something supernatural like, like Moses and Aaron did in, in taking the staff and it becomes a snake? Or was this just kind of trickery? The word magician is used there. Um, I don't, was it used in our text or was it um, sorcerers? Um, Wise men and sorcerers, oh, and magicians, so, so yeah. Um, basically, yeah, people who delved into the occult and um, maybe had um, worship, you know, kind of, kind of uh, connections to the, their worship and their supernatural. So yeah, did they really perform a miracle? And I think, I believe the answer is yes. They really did perform a miracle. However, it was a different power source. So for Moses and Aaron to do it, what was the power source? The power source is clearly God. When Jesus does a miracle, the power source is him. He's God. When the Apostle Paul, when the disciples do a miracle, it's clearly God. This is an entirely different power source, and it is one that is not God. So it's evil, and, and we know that uh, the devil is a fallen angel, and he is a demon, and he has demonic power. So yes, there's power there, but a different scary power source. Um, interesting, too, that they're able to copy what Aaron did. And the New Testament talks about you know the, 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 the miracles of Antichrist, basically that um, they're a counterfeit miracle. So um, kind of a fraud, like, like a copy like that. So rather than just doing their own miracle, hey, this is our sign, um, they're able to copy um, what Aaron did. I think there's some significance to that. And maybe it shows, um, yeah, there's power there, but it's not as great as, as the original. And Aaron's staff consumed the others right? So God was saying something with that too. Yeah, you can, you can have your little magic trick here for a moment, but look at that. I mean, yours just got eaten up. Your snake or staff has been consumed. So even with that, God has given a pretty clear message, isn't he? And yes, their power is limited. So even though they're able to copycat plague number one, and next week, we're also going to look at plague number two, the frogs. They're able to copycat that. 
But when we get to plague number three, which I think is the gnats, um, they're going to say, well, this, this is beyond us. We, we can't do that. All right. Next section then is Exodus chapter 7, verses 14 through 24. Ah, uh, then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Um, go to the Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the water, um, as he goes out to the river. Confront him on the bank of the Nile and take in your hand the staff of, excuse me, the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that we may worship God in the wilderness. But until now, you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this, you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile. And all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died. And the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water because they could not drink the water of the river. All right, our last section for today, a question for us to ponder. I just thought this was interesting, the significance of Moses waiting for Pharaoh in the morning. So God said, uh, go in the morning. As he goes out to the water, wait on the bank of the Nile to meet him. So... <laughs> I, I, I think that's interesting. Um, I think God is saying something by, by doing that. So maybe Pharaoh had his routine, like all of us, to get up in the morning, and Pharaoh's was to go perhaps clean up and, and bathe in the Nile, and guess who is waiting for him? I'd say that's fairly aggressive. Um, you know, so, so God, again, is saying something, and, and it is this. Um, it's been a long time of waiting. It's been a long time. Now, of course, the Israelites have not been enslaved for 400 plus years, but they've been in Egypt for 400 plus years. And, you know, there's that, you know, we're, we're, we're creatures who get used to um, a pattern. And this is just, this is the way it is. You're enslaved and we're the, we're the power. And God is saying, Pharaoh, no, no, the, the Lord is here and it is time to act, and things are changing, and guess who is waiting for you, and here is your warning. Um, it's beginning. So that time of long waiting is over. Another question has to do with Bible critics. Um, as you know, as you're not surprised, there are many people who want to poke holes in the Bible, and they want to criticize the Bible. So everything from you know, can we trust the Bible? Is the Bible from God? Is it from man to Jesus? Did he really die on the cross? Um, did he really rise from the dead? So, you know, miracles, everything, anything supernatural. So people uh, attack that. And one of the things that happens with the book of Exodus is this question, was the changing of the Nile to blood just a naturally occurring event that became exaggerated in the book of Exodus? So what that is saying is that really wasn't blood in the water. What happened was the, the Nile flooded, and then you had all this red silt that, that came down the river, and everybody just thought it was blood, and they were deceived, and Moses used that and convinced people that it was blood, whatever, um, and it, there was nothing miraculous about it. So that's a critic of the Bible, right? That's what they would say. And just a couple of thoughts um, regarding that. I, I guess one thought is this. 
Um, <laughs> the Nile flooded every year. Um, it, was a, it was a natural thing. Um, they'd, they'd all seen flooded Nile water river before. Um, the, the Nile was, the, there was a pattern to this. And so we don't know what time of year this was. Granted, it, it could have been uh, the, the rainy season where it was flooding. Maybe it was the dry season where it wouldn't flood. But, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit to another point I'm going to make, but sometimes, you know, these critics assume everyone's an idiot. Don't they? I mean, like they had never seen the, the the water of the Nile flood before. It's kind of like around here. We have a thunderstorm, and what happens to all the creeks and all the rivers? They turn they turn red. Um, the Red River is just down the road here from church. It's called the Red River. Why do you suppose it's called the Red River? Because all the red silt gets in there and and the clay um, every time it rains. And it, I don't think it happens too often where people look at that and go, "Oh, that's blood," right? Um, and everything, yeah, and, and that goes to the next point. Um, if it were just silt water, why does it die? And why do all the fish die? And why does everything stink? And why is the water undrinkable? So even with silty water, you can still go fishing because the fish don't die. Even with silty water, um, the river is not going to suddenly start stinking. Like you imagine blood? I mean, this is blood. It's, it's, it's got to be gross. Um, it started stinking. Why? Because it's blood and, and the fish die and everything is stinking. And finally, the, the water is undrinkable. And it seems like, and it doesn't make any sense um, to say that this was just silt because even the stuff that it sounds like if they had drawn water out the night before and they had it sitting in a, in a jar or a bucket or something, it also turned to blood. Anything that came from the Nile turned to blood. So again, those, those critics, you know, you, you have to suspend your, your logic um, to make it fit. Um, granted, water turning to blood is, is not logical, but from the hand of God, um, that's what we call a miracle, right? Something that is supernatural. So yeah, that, that kind of thinking just doesn't make any sense. And think about this, um, the Nile River itself was a god, as were the moon and the sun and the stars. And what is God saying to Pharaoh? You know, this mighty Nile River that you worship, I can mess with it if I want to. I have power over it because it's not God. I am God, and look what I can do to your God. And I think, you know, a little bit more scrutiny and a little bit more um, examination, there's, there's a powerful message that God is sending there. And yeah, I touched on that already. People are not idiots. It's the same thing in the New Testament. I read a while ago, um, Jesus walking on water. And some scientist somewhere said, well, Jesus was probably either walking on a sandbar or the water had frozen and he was walking on ice. So again, you're assuming then the disciples that saw Jesus were idiots. They had no idea what a sandbar was. They had no idea what ice was. Um, you can come up with your, with your explanations, but it doesn't make any sense. And not only that, they're fishermen. They spent their lives on the water. I think they would know if something were a sandbar or if there were ice. Again, we're not spending too much time on that probably, on negative critics, but it is interesting sometimes how people stretch to, to make their theories fit. So that is basically our section for today. We're going to close by just a little bit of application. Um, final thoughts. As a child of God, as I look at this section of God's word, what does God want me to know? Well, he wants me to know about Moses. He wants me to know about his power, his power over false gods. We're going to have more of that in the upcoming weeks. But maybe personal, personal thoughts to personal application, what struck me. How could Pharaoh be so stubborn? Um, right. He's refusing to listen. Um, the staff becomes a snake. The water turns to blood. His magicians, the secret arts, power of the devil, they're able to do the counterfeit miracle again. Um, how can I be so stubborn, though, sometimes, too? That's a fair question. How can I be so stubborn when God shows me all the miracles that he performs in his word, when he tells me that, when I've got the, the continual blessings that he gives me each and every day, and at times I am so ungrateful and just stubborn? 
refusing to, to go to his word, you know, I'd, I'd rather worry endlessly, right, than, than bring to him a prayer um, that, that will bring me peace, you know, all of these many examples. So to ask myself that too, um, am I not the stubborn one at times? And then what am I worshiping? Um, what's the, the quote that sometimes um, the very thing that becomes our God, um, God can also use to judge us. So, right, if my God is, is money or if my God is, um, you know, living the good life or, or whatever it might be or, or you know, so many of the, the different addictions that, that we have in our world or, or the sins that we easily go to, um, I'm making them my God if they become more important to me than God, if I'm disobeying him. And those God can use to judge me, right? If, if uh, I, uh, they become my God, if they become more, more important to me than God. So bottom line, what, what am I worshiping? Who am I worshiping? We always return to the Lord. Um, we go there as uh, sinners, um, realizing in many ways we, we mess up our priorities. We, we um, are stubborn. We worship the wrong things. We pursue the wrong things. And yet we cling to God's promises. As he was faithful to Moses and his people, um, he is faithful to us and assures us of that forgiveness that we have in Jesus, our Savior. What a wonderful comfort for us. What wonderful peace that we have. And all the more reason for us to keep going back to our God and worshiping him. We are at our time for today. Thank you for um, joining in here. I enjoyed the, the study, the preparation once again. I really appreciate the time to dig into God's word and then uh, be able to present that to you. So until next time, next time, I just want to give a little heads up. We're going to take Exodus chapter 8 through chapter 9, verse 7. That will be the next four plagues. So we've got, that will take us halfway through the plagues. We'll take the next four the following week, and then we'll get into that final plague of the plague on the firstborn and the Passover and everything there. So um, plagues two, three, four, five, if you want to cheat ahead, you certainly can. Don't have to, though, but that's our plan. For next week, until then, or until next time, God be with you, God bless you, and he certainly will as we study his word together.